Now, if you've been following my channel, you'll notice that I've done some uh, videos on how to use dual cores, two cores in microcontrollers like the Raspberry Pi Pico, how you program that within Arduino, what the power differences are when you use both cores. And I thought it was time to expand into more talk about uh, dual core programming, how you manage to program, whether it's a desktop, whether it's a microcontroller, whether it's a laptop, a server, how you can use multiple cores all at once. And to kick that series off, we're going to be looking at fork and POSIX threads, P threads. Okay, so if you want to find out more, please let me explain. Okay, let's start by looking at fork. So fork, as in like fork in the road, splits the process uh, into two. Technically, it creates a new process by duplicating the original process, the calling process, and the new process is referred to as a child process, the child process, and the calling process is referred to as the parent process. The child process and the parent process run in their own separate memory spaces, so they literally are two new processes running on the uh, on the CPU. Just if you were running, you know, I don't know, you know, Firefox uh, and Solitaire, you know, they're completely separate. They don't interact with each other. They have their own memory space. But at the time of the fork, at that very moment you call fork, their memories contain exactly the same thing. Then there's another bit of code that happens, and we can start then to see how it diverges. They diverge from each other as each process knows what code it's going to run. The child process is an exact duplicate of the parent process, except for in the following points. It has its own process ID, its own PIC, it's its own process, and it doesn't inherit certain types of kernel level things. So memory locks, pending signals, timers, and things like that. So you really wouldn't want to do this in a complex system right in the middle of when the whole system is up and running. This is the kind of thing you do right at the very beginning because you know you have to spawn some extra processes, listen on extra ports, do some extra workers, whatever it is. You do it fairly uh, early on in the, in the code flow. So let me try and show you this as a little diagram. We've got a process here with a PID of 12781. And this process is running some code. And at some point it calls fork. And the, really, the, it's just that, it's called fork. There's nothing more complicated than this function call. And at this point, the original process now becomes the parent. It's got the same PID, it's still 12781. So the same process uh, is running just as it was before. However, as a result of the fork, something else happens. Another process, the child, is created, and that's got a different PID here. I've put one for uh, 882 just to show it's a completely different PID running its own memory space, a completely different process. So what you've done is you've taken this one and you've split it into the parent and the child, and at this very point here, they're exact copies of each other, and then the code carries on running, and uh, the child will go off and do its own thing, the parent will go off and do its own thing, uh, and uh, then obviously they will diverge. Now, on the success of the fork call, the PID of the child process is returned to the parent. So once you call fork, if you get a number back, in this case, 14882, you know you're the parent and you know the child process has this PID. And the child uh, gets zero and zero is returned to the child. So if you then check the result of fork, if it's zero, you know you're the child process. And in fact, that's what we're gonna do in the source code to do exactly that, to see how it works. So here is a snippet bit of code. It's basically the blueprint of what you need to do. So you would start off by calling fork. The result goes into this variable called child, which holds the PID. And then you have an if statement. If child, well, if, of course, if it's zero, that's going to be false. That means you're the parent. If you come back with a PID here, 14882, I think it was, then that means you are now the parent, the original person, and you can carry on writing code in here inside of this if statement, obviously you'd probably just call a function that goes off and does whatever it needs to do for the parent. And if it's else, if it was zero, that means you're the child process, you're the other process, and now you can start running code in here, go and call a function to do whatever it is that the child needs to do. So at this point, you can see it's been split in half, one going one way, one going the other way, and you can do different things now. You can listen on different ports, you can process different messages in a queue, you can open up different network connections, whatever it is these processes have got to do, they can now do that. Okay, so let's head over to Visual Studio Code and to the command line and see some of this code uh, in action. Okay, so here we are in uh, Visual Studio Code. This is actually running on the Windows subsystem for Linux. And as we can see here, there's basically this code that I showed you, a bit more padded out. For example, I've got some error checking going on here. 
uh, and what we do here in if it's the if it's the parent which means child is zero then i'm going to print out this is the parent and then basically i'm going to print out the numbers uh zero through to nine which is going to come up on the screen if it's the the child process then i'm going to say this is the child process and i'm going to print the numbers from 100 to 109. so what we should see on the screen is a sequence where the parent process is printing things out and the child process are printing things out and they are able to uh, and they're being printed out onto the screen and we can see them and depending on the scheduling we might see them interleaved we might see them in you know the parent process gets a bit of time in the child process uh, i think running it here on the windows substance for Linux, they basically get a good ch uh, chunk of the time each and they kind of come out one after the other so let's compile this and uh, and run it so to compile it we do gcc minus o uh, fork one is this name of the source so, so fork one for the binary fork one uh, dot c that compiles and now if we run fork one there we go so oh it actually there yeah, <laughs> i said it would be would be different but what you actually see is that you see the parent actually got zero one two three four five out then the child process got a bit of a look in then the parent process did some more and then the child process did a, a run there until the end let's run that again and see whether we get the same thing yes we do let's run it in an actual window i think that might be different Okay, so here I am in just the uh, normal Ubuntu window here. I'm in the same direct. Let's run fork one. There you go. There you go. So it's all about the scheduling that happens in these different subsystems. In this case, you can see they basically got a slice of the pie each as we're going down one after the other. When you run it in the terminal here inside of Visual Studio Code, it, it's actually a bit more higgledy-piggledy there. Okay, so there you go. That is a practical example of how you run fork. Now, threads are different to forking. When you fork, you create another process that is a copy of yourself, but then runs off in its own area of memory. A thread is an execution thread through the same program, sharing the same memory. So you don't create another process, you're inside that same process, you share global memory, and you are able to access the same, in fact, the threads can even communicate with each other by accessing the different bits or of memory so POSIX threads P threads is a standard API for threaded programming in C a single process can contain multiple threads all of which are executing the same program they may execute different paths of course because you can have if statements you know different ones can listen on different ports maybe you have one listening on one port one then listening on one port one processing something in one queue some something checking some file whatever they can run different things but it's the same source code that you've compiled together into the same binary and these threads share the same address space and therefore the same global memory but each thread has its own stack so if you call a function and inside of that you create a local variable you know i because you're doing a loop then obviously it wants its own copy of that loop uh, so it can go around you don't want that clashing with something else so local variables are the same for every thread but the global variables are used also memory that you've allocated with malloc or with using c plus plus or whatever uh, they are shared amongst all of the threads so here's a diagrammatic uh, look at that. So here I've got a process and it's got a normal one thread of execution. That's what happens as you run your program, you know, open up files, open up a database. If this, else do that, you know, write something to memory, you know, whatever, open up a network connection. And it's just going about his business, flowing down this process, whatever it is that your process uh, is doing. Or equally, just be a game, you know, you're just moving uh, through the 3D world, through the 2D world, and you just kind of have code that just does that. Now, at some point, you can call pthread create, and that creates a new thread. So then what happens, you have the same process, got the same process ID, but now there are two paths of execution through it. So there's two things going through this code. Some of them may be going down like this. The other one, may be, you know, they may be in sync, they may be out of sync. This one can take different decisions. It can go down different uh, paths depending on you know, network connections, as I said, databases, games, you know, whatever's happening, you could have one path controlling one for controlling the enemies, one doing the sideways scrolling, whatever. I mean, you can do uh, it however you want. And then you can create more threads. You can create another one. So if we have another thread here, we can create a third one. And with this third thread, I really have shown that it can go all over the place. And it doesn't have to follow this same path of execution because you can give the thread whatever task it is you want it to do. And it just goes ahead and, and does it and follows that code. But the important thing is it's all one process, which means these threads can communicate with each other internally 
using, as I say, just memory, whether that's variables or allocated memory, uh, and they are showing the same resources. So, you know, if you load up a bitmap or something, the same bitmap will be you can be used by different threads. The same database can be used by different threads, same network, whatever. So, you know, we've got this way of them all uh, working together inside of the process. Now, the code is fairly simple. So let's say I've got a function here called do something. And it just prints out this. Thorin sits down and starts singing about gold. Let's see who the first person in the comments can tell me where that comes from. And so this function do something will just print something out. Not very complicated. Obviously, as I said, this could be doing all kinds of things with databases or whatever. Now, in the main code, what you do is we define this uh, this p thread uh, ha uh, t uh, t uh, ID, the task ID, the thread ID, sorry, that we have here. That's going to hold the information about the thread that gets created. Then we call p thread create. You pass in a pointer here to that TID1, so that the handler handle is written to that. You can pass in some parameters, won't worry about those now, and you tell it which function you want to call, do something. So that's going to call, this thread is going to call that. And then p thread join, it always seems like a, a funny thing, but basically p thread join basically means wait. Wait for thread number one to finish. So this main program, which in itself is a thread, will wait for the main program for, the, for that thread to finish. And you can use this idea of waiting for threads uh, so that you can uh, make sure the job has been done before you either move on to the next stage or until you you know finish the whole program. So basically, we've done three things. We declare a variable which is going to hold the handle to the thread. We create the thread and then we wait for the thread to finish. Of course, it will finish very quickly because it will just do uh, the printf and then it will exit. But the execution is, is the same as whether that did a million operations or just did one operation. You've basically got the same thing. OK, so now let's go over to Visual Studio Code and to the, to the command line and look at uh, some threaded programs, two examples I've got, and show you how those work. OK, so let's have a look how you use the uh, threading. In this case, I've got three functions, do something one, do something two, do something three, with three different statements. Uh, time passes. Again, I wonder who can work out where that comes from. Uh, do nothing much. Well, I don't think that comes from anywhere. And of course, Thorin sits down and starts singing about gold, as I mentioned uh, earlier on. And then here down in the main, we basically repeat what I showed you there earlier three times. I've got some error checking in here now as well to see whether the threads actually get created. But basically, I can call p thread create once. I can call it twice. I can call it three times. And each time I call do something one, do something two, and do something three. And then at the end, I do a join on each one thread ID 1, thread ID 2, thread ID 3, to see whether, to wait for all three of them to finish, and then it will, uh, the whole program will exit. Okay, so let's try and run that and see what happens. Now we have to compile it slightly differently. We do minus P thread, so it knows it's using P thread minus O uh, th thread, uh, and of course we're compiling thread dot C. Okay, so now let's run thread. There you go, do nothing much. Thorin sits down and starts singing and time passes. They basically ran inside the same process, but one of those, each one of those statements came out from a different thread. So a very simple example just shows you how to encrypt the thread, do something very simple and then and then exit. In fact, the next demo will give it a bit more complicated. Uh, I've called it the thread tool because you can tell it how many threads you want to create. Let, let's jump into the code and have a look at that. Okay, so this program is a little bit more complicated. It can create a dynamic amount of threads depending on a parameter that you pass in. So here I've defined uh, the, the maximum number of threads we support, the default number if you don't supply anything on the command line, and you have an array here now of the task IDs. Uh, and we have here the number that we're going to create because as I said, that is dynamic. The function do something now, high from thread, and it gives you the thread number. We then sleep for a certain amount of time that will be longer the higher, the more threads you create. And that will give us a kind of a dynamic here so we can see threads being created, threads uh, exiting at different times. And then it says buy from that thread when it's about to exit. In the main program, this bit of code here is just a standard code for how we get a variable passed in. In this case, the number of threads is the parameter and we just use convert the string to long. Obviously, lots of things could go wrong here in terms of error checking and so on. If I typed in, you know, create threads, Z, you know, rather than 
five, what does it do? But we, there we go. We'll just leave that in there because it's a test tool. And basically we've got two parts of the code. Uh, what we do here in this while loop is we go round the number of threads we're gonna create. We call pthread create, passing in the uh, thread ID is gonna be the, the handle is what is in that array. And we always call the same function do something, but we can pass in the parameter in this case i, which is what we're using here, this counter here. So each thread, I, thread I'm thread zero, I'm thread one, I'm thread two, I'm thread th three, and so on. Bit of error checking there. And once they're all created, we then wait for them all to finish by using pthread join again, just going through this array, uh, doing it. So we create 10 threads, and then we wait for 10 threads to finish. You type in 50 as the parameter, it will create 50 threads, and then wait for 50 threads to finish. Uh, this is a good way of seeing, you know, how many threads can you create before you break the system? It actually does seem to work with 500, so that, that's pretty good. Okay, so let's uh, let's compile it again and, and see how it runs. So GCC minus uh, P thread minus O uh, thread tool, and we, the code is thread tool dot C. Okay, and now we just let's just run it first of all, thread tool. Okay, the default is 10, so as you can see here, starts to create them higher from thread zero, buy from thread zero, higher from thread two, thread one is down here, you see, so you can never guarantee the order these things are going to happen in because it's to do with the scheduling that the kernel gives you, or the operating system gives you. Okay, two, three, four, then one, then five, then three finishes, because obviously the timings now are different for that sleep. Uh, and then, you know, it starts to go on at seven, eight, uh, and nine like that. We can do it more. We could say, let's create a hundred of them. So there you go. It created them. Some of them are exiting now as their timers are going. Let's say a buy from three, what, 64, let's keep going. What does it go all the way up now there to 94? That means 99 was earlier. There it is, yet yeah, buy from 99. So it, they did all go uh, run there. Go on, are you feeling for 500? Let, let's see what happens. Okay, let's fast forward to the end. Okay, there we go, it's finished, 498, 497, 499, there you go, the last one there. So, a system like this can create 500 threads and then, and then they do something and they can all process. Obviously, CPU time is a finite resource, but it's able to do it uh, if that's what you needed to do inside of your program. Okay, that's it. My name's Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. If you like these kind of videos, why not stick around by subscribing to the channel? Don't forget, you can follow me on Twitter at Gary Explains, and I also have a monthly newsletter. Go to GaryExplains.com, type in your email address, no spam, but you will get the newsletter. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.